Our scripture today deals with the feeding of the 5,000. And this is how it is recorded in the sixth chapter of John. So listen now to what is written. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages could not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. The word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, let us ever be open to what you can do. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning, our true sermon is seen here at the table. When we come forward in a few moments to the table of grace, then we recognize the enormity of what we receive in this sacrament. It is incredible. And so I want us to focus on the story that we just read through the eyes of the sacrifice that is represented here in the bread and in the cup. We continue our sermon series on whatever happened to, looking at those disciples and apostles that, that didn't get as much airtime as others might have. And, and we've looked at several of them, and we have a couple of more after today. But today we are going to focus on Andrew. Andrew is um, the brother of Simon Peter. And in most art, you can see that Andrew is always depicted as, an, as an, an, a man with a long white beard, an elderly gentleman. And it is thought that one of the remarkable things that Andrew did is that he introduced his brother to Jesus. And in coming to that understanding that Jesus was the one they had all been waiting for, Peter's life has changed forever. Andrew, after the resurrection, made his way all the way to Kiev and into Russia. He is credited with establishing the Sea of Byzantium, later known as Constantinople. And then a number of centuries after that, a, um, a lot of his relics, reliquaries, were, were taken to Scotland, many who think that happened by divine guidance, and he became the patron saint of Scotland as well. Andrew was crucified on a cross that is known as the St. Andrew cross in the shape of an X. It is thought that when it came to his martyrdom that he refused to be crucified on a Latin cross like Jesus because he felt like he was not worthy. Instead, this, this uh, St. Andrew's cross is the symbol for this apostle Andrew. In our scripture, we see that, that uh, what seems to be the overriding thing in this passage is the thought of practicality and impossibility. But Andrew seems to have a different approach, and as Jesus begins to ask, what are we going to do, Andrew comes up with something that I think that we need to, to incorporate into our own lives, and that is, I believe, Andrew always saw the possibility the possibilities. And the first thing that I think that we can see is that he saw the possibility of possibilities that, that the lives of his friends and family could be completely different 
because of Jesus. We know that the two brothers were fishermen, that probably they came from a long line of fishermen. They were known as sons of Jonas. But it's incredible when you consider that uh, they were brothers and that Andrew is the one who introduced Peter to Jesus, that Peter gets, it would seem, almost a higher veneration than Andrew. You know, Simon was, had his name changed by Jesus to Peter, which means rock. And Jesus said, upon this rock, upon your ministry, I will build my church. And that beautiful basilica in, in Vatican City is not called St. Andrew's, it's called St. Peter. And we know much more about Peter's faith struggle than we do about anyone else and how he struggled with his doubt along with Thomas. But Andrew saw something completely possible in the life of his brother. Andrew was a disciple, follower of John the Baptist. And he had heard John the Baptist say, there is one who comes after me whose sandal I'm not even worthy to tie. And when John the Baptist began to say that this Jesus, this itinerant preacher who was, who was lifting up a standard that was very different than the standard that was, that was uh, a commonly held standard, Andrew recognized that this was truly the Messiah. So the first thing he did is that he went to his brother and said, I have found him. I have found the one we have been waiting for. And as Jesus comes walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and says to the two of them, come and follow me, I will make you fishers of people. Andrew and Peter's lives are changed forever and the rest, as they say, is history. It is sometimes really difficult for us to share our faith life with, with those who are the closest to us, with, with friends and with families. They know who we are. They, they've seen us at our best and they've seen us at our worst. And so sometimes there's this thought that, that we may not have our message received in a, in a good way. And especially when, when there's a, a sense of dysfunction that would cause us to pull back or feel like that we are going to be judged, then we don't readily share with those close to us. It's much easier to share with someone else. And that especially happens to so many people when, when their life changes because of their faith. I remember one in particular, a young woman who was in seminary with me. She had grown up in the Midwest, and she came from a very, very affluent family. Both of her parents were doctors, and, and uh, she, was, she was on the road to entering medical school. She went to a large university in the Midwest, and she said that uh, one of her friends started going to a Bible study in small group that was held in the dorm, and one day Laura decided to go with her, and she said it wasn't soon before she was, as she put it, sold out to the gospel. She recognized that she had a call to ministry, and so she shared with her parents that instead of going to medical school, she was going to go to seminary and, and enter into the ministry. Laura said her parents were the very best among the Christmas and Easter uh, attendees at their local Methodist church, and, and they were fine with, with her going to Bible study, but when she started talking about changing her life in such a way to go to seminary and into the ministry, they cajoled and they argued and they were very upset that she would not follow what they thought was the purpose of her life. We were nearing graduation when Laura was telling me the story, and she had been involved in a ministry for at-risk children in, in the inner city of Fort Worth, close to where our seminary was, and, and she was going to go back to this Midwest city, and she was going to work with a, a ministry that was very much like that, a lifestyle very different than the lifestyle her parents had envisioned for her. But she was very excited and, and felt like that this was truly God's leading for her to participate in this ministry. 
I reconnected with Laura a few years ago through Facebook, and uh, she was still in this ministry in inner city, uh, in the inner city, and she had changed countless lives by ministering to those at-risk children and their families. She shared with me, you'll never believe who is doing this with me. And I tried to think of all of our seminary classmates who I knew were from that part of the country, and she said, it's my parents. She said that uh, when she went back and began in this ministry, she would have times to share with her parents, and her parents began to see something different in Laura. They saw the peace, and they saw the passion. They saw the joy that didn't make any sense, and so they started asking her, how did you get to this point? What was this about? And she said, in the most amazing way, I was able to introduce my parents to the love of Christ. The possibility of possibilities when we bring our family and friends to Jesus, just like Andrew did with Peter. And the possibility of possibilities in the face of having just a little. You know, this is a very familiar story, this feeding of the 5,000. And what's really incredible about it is the different reactions that we see. You know, this was apparently something that just happened on a spontaneous moment because apparently no one brought provision at all. But all these people started gathering and they, they wanted to hear Jesus speak and they, they, they knew that Passover was coming and what that would mean and what they would need to do, but, but they wanted to hear and they just, they just kept staying there and listening and listening and, and Jesus was like, what are we going to do? We need to feed these people. The first, um, whatever happened to that we talked about was Philip. And, and we see Philip's reaction. Philip was like, hey, listen, we don't have that much money. We can't, there's no way we can do this. Andrew, however, instead of seeing what they didn't have, began to think about the possibility of possibilities that there might be a different way that, that God would provide. So he started to look at what did they have. And he went throughout that, that sea of, of humanity, and he found this little boy, this one little boy who had had enough forethought to bring a picnic lunch with him. And he brings this little boy back to Jesus and says, okay, this is... This is what we have. We have these five loaves and these two fish. And Jesus said, that's great. And instead of the scarcity mentality, when Jesus blessed and began to share that bread and the fish with those people, you saw what the scripture said. All of them had plenty to eat and 12 baskets left over. Scarcity mentality can be the death of any kind of endeavor. When we are scared that, that we will not have enough, when, when churches operate out of a scarcity mentality instead of what could God do through us, we began to lose focus and, and, and we succumb to fear and there is nothing that we can do to break ourselves out of it unless we can look around and see what God might be doing. When that door of scarcity slams shut, it is an opportunity for us to see what amazing things can take place in our lives. Praying fishes and loaves is something that I've done a lot in my life, and I can remember especially Wednesday evening meals that we had at our church, and, and we had just started them, and, and more and more people started to come, and, and we didn't take reservations, and we didn't know how many were there, and I can remember vividly standing behind the counter and seeing more and more people line up, and I had just this so much fried chicken, and I just prayed fishes and loaves over all of those wings and, and drumsticks, praying that everyone would get at least one piece of chicken, fishes and loaves. The possibility of possibilities that God has a different plan, that God's provision will be available. Andrew saw that possibility. He saw the possibility of changed lives and the possibility of 
God doing something miraculous. And he saw the possibility of possibility in widening the circle of those who needed Jesus. William Barclay is a, is a great biblical scholar, and, and he wrote about Andrew and the fact that we, we don't see a lot about Andrew. But every time we see Andrew, the three major times we see Andrew, we see him when he, when he brings Peter to Jesus, and we see him when he brings a little boy and his picnic lunch to Jesus, and, and we see him later on in John when there is a group of Greeks who want to see Jesus, but they're not really sure how to, how to make that happen. William Barclay says this, It was Andrew's great joy to bring others to Jesus. He stands out as the man whose one desire was to share the glory. He is the man with a missionary heart. Having himself found the friendship of Jesus, he spent all his life in introducing others to that friendship. Andrew is our great example in that he could not keep Jesus to himself. There was nothing more diametrically opposed probably than how one practiced the Hebrew faith and how the Greeks practiced their faith. But there was something about what Jesus was saying and what they had heard that they wanted to see for themselves. And you get the feeling that they felt like they might not have been welcomed in that group. So Andrew became aware of it through Philip. And Andrew, Andrew does not have attributed to him a name in Hebrew or Aramaic. And Andrew, Andreas, was a, was a Greek name meaning valor. And so when these Greeks come to him and they want to meet Jesus, Andrew's first thought is the possibility of possibilities that, that the circle is ever widening. And no longer was Jesus meant just for the Hebrew people. So he makes the introduction and begins to live out the Great Commission before Jesus even proclaims it to go into the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ. There were no boundaries. There were no limitations. And Andrew saw the possibility of possibilities of bringing others to Jesus I want to focus back on our scripture passage on, on a couple of verses. Verse 10 says, Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Two things I want you to focus on. First of all, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was some practicality in this. If they were seated, it was easier to distribute the fishes and the loaves. But I think it also does one other thing that is, that is important for us to grasp, and that is they became focused on the one who was providing Jesus was the one who blessed the meal. When we come to this table of grace in a moment, I would invite you to focus on the one who is providing this. And I know in many of our lives there is something that we think is impossible, that we think cannot be dealt with, but I would invite you, whatever that is in your life, as you come to this table, imagine the possibility of possibilities that there is a way, there is healing, there is reconciliation. 
Because the one who is the focus is the one who can change our life. And what we need to do is decide how to respond. The possibility of possibilities. Let those with ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. For it's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.